Thank you so much, everyone, for having me here. Generally, all, all my talks or presentations, I would like to keep it as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hands. Anyone joining online, if you have some questions, just put it in the chat. Then maybe Adam can read them out and then we can discuss. So yeah, Adam already introduced. I'm from EKFZ Dresden now, but I'm doing my PhD from RWTH Aachen. So it's been a nice experience. So mostly working on decentralized learning, swarm learning, so which I will be explaining in the upcoming slides. So I'd like to have a disclosure. I don't have any conflict of interest. And um, in this presentation, I would like to divide the presentation into two main parts. Initially, a little bit more detailed explanation on swarm learning. How is the architecture set up? What are the different components? How is the communication protocol happening? What are the requirements if someone feels interested to collaborate? What are the requirements that they need to set up Swarm Learning? And then end-to-end uh, -end basic workflow. What do we need to set up a Swarm Learning? And the second part would be uh, application-oriented. Like I'll speak a little bit on the publications that we have had. What was the workflow that we used for this publication? How was the study designed mostly? And then which were the cohorts that we used for this analysis and then some advantages and disadvantages. So if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hands. And then if there's any specific slide that you want me to come back and explain in detail, I'm happy to do that. So these are some of the overview on today's presentation that we'll be having. So when we speak about decentralized learning, it is very important to give a basic understanding of which are the different types of learning approaches that we can have. Uh, there is something called as local learning, which we generally have a model and some data locally and we train it. Then there is centralized learning. Then there is federated learning. Then we have the one which we propose that's the swarm learning, which is used in histopathology analysis in this workflow. I will explain each of them a little bit in detail so that everyone comes to, comes to the same point and then we can go in detailed discussion about these, uh, each of the learning uh, types. So here, as you see, there's one data source, there's one system, and then we use this data source to train a model. And this is basically local training. You can do it on your laptop or any system. So it's very straightforward, one single data source, and you have a model which or model or a system which is used to train a model for a specific application locally. The second one is centralized learning where there are multiple data centers, maybe three different institutes or n different institutes. All the data is taken to a single server and then a computational or a system is used to compute or a model is used to generate to predict certain, yeah, maybe microsatellite instability or any target that we want to do. But here you can see the local training has some disadvantages, like generally the data is insufficient and the models that we obtain from this local training are suboptimal. They are not the best models. And here in the centralized learning, the models might be good, but there is a lot of data movement back and forth. And then there is inefficiency that we have here. And then data privacy, data ownership, especially when we are dealing with a lot of medical and patient data, data privacy and data ownership becomes a very important part that we have to address. So that's why that's a big problem in the centralized learning approach. And when we speak about uh, decentralized learning, this is a very big topic of discussion by itself, federated learning and there is swarm learning. So in federated learning, you can see there are multiple systems and you don't actually share the data, but only the weights and biases are shared, but it goes to a central server. So this is the main disadvantage that the swarm learning plays advantage at this point that the central coordinator can be a big player or a big company, which can later on say, okay, if you want to use our models, you have to maybe pay a certain amount to use the models. So that's why a small contributor who made possible this arrangement may not have the model to use. So that's why the centralization was an issue. Then, then there was a proposal for swarm learning, which is completely decentralized. No central coordinator has the, act, uh, has the rights to say he will do the merging or the learning is completely decentralized. There are different architectural approaches for this. And it's very secure because there is a 
identity management server as well as there is license server which manages the identity so some disadvantages on swarm learning aspect is it's very centralized as i told you and there is high risk of attack if one if the central server or the central node gets attacked then the data can be compromised there are some papers or documentations which say that if uh, with the weights and biases the image can be reconstructed so somehow this is a very a uh, big issue in federated learning which can be addressed by using some homomorphic encryptions and so on so but in swarm learning it is completely decentralized it can be scaled to a very good level privacy is preserved and the risk of attacks is relatively low so what was the inspiration that led us to do this project or come up with this are these two uh, papers or publications there was a publication on swarm learning which was mostly dealing with clinical imaging and clinical data uh, and then our group uh, from my supervisor um, professor jakob kather and our group had this very good paper which was predicting microsatellite instability with histology um, images like histopathology images and then try to predict microsatellite instability then we thought why not put these two very interesting things together and have a proof of concept that why can't we put these two together and be the first ones to use swarm learning in histopathology and then we use the hp pipeline they had their github we use that and then we try to replicate these in our field so, so this um, um, paper on the left hand side of, mm. of that slide that's from the hp uh, no that is uh, that's not from hp this is from one of the researching group from Germany. And then HP used this as the uh, research work to build this whole pipeline. And then they made this, yeah, GitHub. That group from Germany, part of your collaboration? Yes, we when we were trying out a few things from the GitHub, uh, there were some issues which we encountered. And then uh, when we were using their framework, we asked them that can we use it for uh, public work and uh, research then they were very happy then we had we asked should we cite you in our papers then they told if we mention them in a acknowledgement that should be enough so that's how we went forward but they had a deal collaborator <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, uh, they had a very good support by looking at the interest that we had why because it was a very good use case for them so that's why they supported it so can you talk more about how it works yes in yes in this management and license uh yes i will speak about different components that we there are in swarm learning so that it's a little bit and not much about the publication and the results that i'll just uh skim through but but if there are any specific questions which you'll feel are more relevant that you need to know you can always ask so swarm learning as i've already told multiple times it is a first decentralized privacy preserving machine learning framework and then how are the models trained that's an important question the models are always trained using different computational sources as well as different data so somehow you need not have a very big data center but have multiple computational sources in different sites which are not so powerful but the data source so is in is in sight it doesn't go or move anywhere so how does the data training takes place? It always takes place at the edge where there is very important uh, data driven decisions to be made. And then why is it important? I have already told the privacy, which is a very important part, as well as a lot of collaborators can come into picture. And then the biggest problem of data sharing can be eliminated with swarm learning. So to make sure I understand clearly. So not all the partners need to have their own compute capacity only okay. some of the partners need to have their own compute uh, depending on their data all the partners need to have their but they need not have a very big compute capacity they, they can have just a small computer which is able to process their data so if you want to obtain a model which is trained on thousands of patients you you as a site just have few hundreds of slides you need to have computational power just enough for your data to be processed you don't need to have a big but then at the end of training you get a model which is trained on thousands of data so that's kind of the advantage so just to be clear when you say process mm -hmm. it, it means pre-processing and training yes pre-processing and training but 
the present uh, workflow that we propose is we do the pre-processing beforehand so that the training becomes faster, but it can all be done on a fly. So it could be achieved with that. So yeah, as soon as we tell about requirements, what do we need? Because as soon as people hear about Swarm Learning, they're interested to know what are the things that we need to have if we want to start a collaboration. So some of the things are like, depending on the application, if you have image or histopathology data, you know it's always computationally expensive. So you need to have GPUs, CPUs, but if you have just tabular data, then it can be even done on a laptop. So it's very easy. So hardware specific to the application that we are dealing with, now we have tried it on uh, Linux operating system with Docker, but it even works on Windows, so it should not be a problem. Training for frameworks, we have tried on PyTorch, PyTorch Lightning, TensorFlow. It supports all the training frameworks. This is a very major point about internet and firewall because a lot of hospitals have their own firewall set up. So this is one, uh, one point where we are trying to address this and generalize this, but every institute that we collaborate comes up with a new challenge of their own because the firewall rules are different for different institutes. So that's something. So preferably when we start a collaboration, we ask the collaborator to have a firewall free or something on a research network so that they can transfer their data there and then we can work at that side. So that would be easy. And then we go to their firewall and then try to get the data, patient data. So the another important thing is you need to have data of any sort. Maybe it, it may be radiology, histology, tabular data, cell sequencing data, or any, any medical related, but it can be any data, but we are most focused on healthcare imaging. So that's why. And here are some of the workflow requirements. This is the pre-processing, and this is mostly the local process so it can the feature extraction can be done with swarm learning as well and it can be done from end to end but this kind of remains fixed so to increase the speed we always propose to have the initial part of pre-processing as the local process and then training and prediction comes under the swarm training so the swarm training the swarm callbacks as well as the uh, model parameter hyperparameter tuning and all that kind of is the last part which is very much done with the swarm training approach that we propose. So this is the architecture, uh, model architecture that we have here. You can see there can be N organizations. So if we have N organizations, here there are different components. So there is data, there are different nodes. What does each of the node mean? Is it's a dockerized container? Then there are different nodes which is used to start the training, but I'll explain each and every node and structure. This is just an overall representation if we have to have an organization, how does each of the node look like? What is the contribution of each of the nodes? So one organization is one host. Here we have two SL nodes. That means two training centers within an organization. It can be any number of training data sources within an organization. It can be even one, but here it is an example for two. So each and every node, what is it important for? I will try to explain it in the upcoming slides. SN is shared learning. Uh, yeah, network. SN is the network node. So here you can see initially, whenever we start a process, we start with the Sentinel node. This initiates the blockchain network, and this is the first node to be started. Then comes the network node. This network node is very important to initiate this blockchain platform as well as to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Here we know that Swarm Learning has peer-to-peer -peer sharing of information. So this node uh, enables the peer-to-peer -peer connection between different nodes. So uh, if we have 10 centers, then the network node has to be started in each and every center and it is communicating with each and every center to give, give out the weights and biases and control that. So swap node is nothing but it is responsible for task, executing tasks. So we may have 10 tasks to train a model on 10 different targets or maybe on different approaches. So swap nodes allows us to assign these tasks on a, on a code. And then based on that, it even helps us to start, stop, and then build the ML containers, start the sharing and stop the sharing and so on. So 
The next important node is the SWCI node. This node basically makes automation very easy. The previous version of uh, Swarm Learning, which was proposed, didn't have this specific node. And then every time you run an analysis, you have to manually sit in three different sites and start at the same time. So now you need not do that. From one side, you can control all the trainings and everything happens automatically. So the automation has become pretty easy with the help of this, this node. It basically, it monitors the whole framework, but this can be shifted from one center to an, another center. So even this is not centralized that one center doesn't have the right on the SWCI. Anyone can start the SWCI and the training should start according to the requirement of the consortium or different sites. So yes, that was the actual uh, exchange of information, the blockchain type of information exchange mm -hmm. that happens between the S and yes, the actual information sharing happens with ports, which I will tell in the upcoming slides, but that happens with the SN nodes. Mm -hmm. So the SL nodes send the information to the SN nodes and then the SN node communicates with each other using ports which are specific to that. I will tell it in the communication protocol. How does these ports share their information? So few other nodes. The SL node is nothing but the node which is running your machine learning algorithm. So this is basically the system in which you are running your algorithm, you're running, you're having your data access, having your pipeline ready. So that's the basic function of the SL node where it shares this kind of shares the insight to the SN node and then the SN node shares it to the other peers and gets it back. So there is a nice uh, flow chart, which I'll show how the sharing of information happens in the upcoming slides. So peer server is somehow for identity map uh, assessment, because it's very important that we don't want an external intruder to come, come into the training process and then somehow share uh, share some information which is not necessary for the model to know. So that's why each and every node has to register with each other peer to peer and then the Spire server does that. So it can be done with the Spire certificates as well as user defined certificates depending on the requirement of the project. So this is how the communication becomes secure. And then finally, there is a license load. Now presently it's maintained by HPE. Each and every collaborator needs to access this license and register to that and then, then they can use the framework. So here you can see the how, how does the process flow happens. Initially, there is always a digital identity acquiring that the Swarm Learning node does, uh, Swarm Learning Framework does, and then it acquires the license. After that, there is node registration, which takes place. Then Swarm Learning says that file server movement or uh, movement is ready, and then you can start the training, and then the training process happens. So two main important uh, parameters that we can we need to know is the minimum number of peers. If you have 10 collaborating partners, then we can set the minimum number of peers to 10, or you can even set it to two, depending on what you really want to do so that it will wait for these many peers to be online or start as soon as this is achieved, then it starts the training process. Till the minimum number of peers are reached, it will not start the process of training, so uh, of merging. And then secondly, you have something called as the synchronization frequency, which is again, very specific to the batches. After how many batches do you want to do the merging or sharing of information? That is something that the user has to set. So yes. The minimum number of peers um, must have some sort of um, impact on the complexity as well, right? Yes, so minimum. After the minimum number of peers, more complex the, the exchange. Yes, uh, more complex the exchange and the time for the waiting time increases with the number of uh, peers increasing. If there are 10 uh, minimum numbers of peers set for 10, till all the 10 sites are online and ready to share the merging, the training process doesn't start. So only the local training happens. If you set the sync interval to five, it will wait till five times the mini batch size. And then it will just wait till there are 10 peers which are online and ready to share. So as the number of peers increases, the complexity and the delay, it is tend to delay. And out when the training is going on, if one of the node loses internet or something like maybe the system shuts down, there is no power. 
then it stops training at that point till the node is up and running again. So that's one concern that if the number of peers are more, you will always have to wait till that point and then continue your training. That's is there any advantage in having more uh, minimum number of peers? Uh, one major advantage of having more peers is you're sure that everyone is contributing. Mm -hmm. If you just set the minimum numbers of peers to two, then as soon as two are online, then they start training. And then by the time all are online, your training might have been even completed at that point. So it makes sure that everyone is contributing to the learning, maybe in a good way, maybe in a bad way, but that's again, that you have to monitor in individually, but it makes sure that everyone is contributing to the learning. Does everyone contribute equally? Or... You can set, you can set your uh, contribution based on the weightage. You can give a weightage to an individual node if if there is one center with uh, ten thousand patients or ten times more data, then uh, you can train that for a lower number of epochs. And the one with this, which is having just hundreds of patients, you can train it for longer and give it lower weightage. So the weightage can be set manually by according to the requirement that you have. So you don't have to okay. for each one to finish their one epoch, for example. No, no. Up. Yes. Okay. So otherwise. It's one really fast and one really slow. Yes, then you're waiting around. Yes, you can wait around and then somehow not just wait for that to complete, but give it a low weightage and then yeah, yeah, yeah. manage or play around with that. Because then you think though that once, um, so if one you're waiting for one to finish learning and you're doing loads of local learning mm -hmm. instead, what if the learning that's been done elsewhere would have, if you had got that update earlier, it would have impacted your future learning. So um, that that's that's a very nice question. But somehow, what we believe is with multiple epochs, somehow at a smaller batch <coughs> batch or a sync interval, the amount of learning contribution is not that big of an uh, impact. So gradually the performance goes on increasing and then eventually you have a converging model. So somehow the sync interval at one sync doesn't play a very big drastic changing role. So somehow it is, it is averaging all the time. So one specific merge doesn't play a very big difference. Okay. In the, yeah. Do you have anything yet? One of them doesn't converge, for example. Uh, yes, but somehow, presently, we don't have something which says uh, if one of them is con not converging or not contributing to the betterment of learning, how can we drop that node or how can we, uh, okay. yeah, uh, how can we say that we shouldn't in include the learning from this? Yeah, but we are working, yeah, yeah, we are working on that. How do we address that that issue? We also got a question online from David Epstein, who says, security seems very heavy. What are the dangers you are guarding against? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah the, I think mainly security is heavy because we are dealing with the medical data and these hospital sectors that we deal if there is an intruder who tries to, yeah, if it is a learning between tense, tens of centers and then if the security is not very strong then an intruder can just change the whole learning process right so that's what we want to say that no one has a control on that that's what we want to cut to say that this is something that no one should have a uh, control that to steer it according to how they want that's what is the reason we have this very high security i think you, you you're guarding against the the, the the intrusion on the security of the on the on the exchange of the data, the, the weights and biases. But if there is an intruder, they could mess with the numbers in the images as well. You're not guarding against that. Yes. So yeah, that that would be the second step of approach, which we say inside we set some specific requirements for the data and that could be a part of pre-processing that can be established that all the centers have this requirement and this is also secured from the uh, internal side so that 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 is yeah that is something that we so should for example do. some of the patches they could replace with chairs images of chairs and tables right? yes true that's <laughs> that's yeah that's that's why we we should re that's one of the major concerns that we want to see how do we assess each and every node? Are they really having a good quality of data or are they really contributing 
towards improving the performance of the model. So that's something we are continuously working on, how to make it better, how to see the how to see a bad intruder and identify that this this person or this is there such a thing as good intruder. <laughs> <laughs> no, like yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, so someone who is trying to manipulate something or not contribute, how do we identify them early? So that's that's something that we are working towards. So here you can see a very nice workflow or flow chart of how does the whole process takes place. First, there is enrollment where all the nodes get registered to itself. And then there is a small local model training. This local model training is to say if we have five uh, sync interval, then five times the mini batch size local model training happens and then it waits for the peers. So the time for merging is something that you say there are 10 peers. So it will wait till all the 10 are up. And then as soon as this criterion is met, then it goes to the parameter sharing part where it exports the model parameters, then it gets it back, then it merges this model parameter and then it checks whether the stopping criterion is reached. So here the stopping criterion should be end of epoch or early stopping. So one of the two, it will check for that. If it is not achieved, then it will go back again, does the second batch or sync, and then repeat it till the stopping criterion is reached. And when it is reached, it comes out and then gives the model to all the peers, which are, so the at the end of the process, what we expect is all the centers should have the same weights and biases to its model. So every site gets the model, which has more or less seen all the data from different sites. So, yeah, so that's that's one thing. And then here is some technology background. Here you can see that the data never leaves the site, the parameters and uh, only the parameters gets exchanged. And then then somehow, how, how this communication happens between ports, I will tell in the next slide, which are the default ports, which are, which needs to be open before, and then how how do we go forward? Sorry, there? can you go to the oh, yes to the previous slide? Yeah, I'm, I might have missed this, but I'm I'm, I'm, I'm it's an it's a naive question. How is this different from federated learning? Can you tell me? Is in in federated learning the merging happens at a single coordinator at every time, but in swarm learning it changes. There is a leader elected mm -hmm. on each sync interval mm -hmm. and that keeps changing so you don't okay. yeah so this selection of leader or smart contact happens with blockchain mm -hmm. so no one has kind of the uh rights to say i am the leader and i do the sharing all the time so that's why it's completely decentralized no one has the one question uh, yes what if the leader drop oh, sorry what if the leader drop what leader drop leader drop uh, there is no leader actually so anyone can drop out so this leader is elected during the sync interval. So when that's what I'm saying. You say little candle in the merging. Oh, so what, after the merging for the yes. Uh what okay, do we, how, how do we have a solution for that? Or uh, expectation of what happened or in time technical frame. Uh and that that's that's a special case which we have not encountered till now. But I think what happens is it will wait. Generally, there is a lot of checks which happen. So before electing a leader for parameter sharing and parameter merging, it, there's always the waiting time. So maybe it will wait till the uh, other site or the leader is back online or, or it just stops the training. It has a certain threshold till it waits and then it just stops the training. So somehow... Okay. Yeah. How, how is the leader chosen then? Uh, leader is chosen by the blockchain network. So blockchain network sees which are the peers which are ready for merging and then it chooses one. Is that network private or public? Which one? The blockchain network. That's not uh, private. That's uh, okay, because you could presumably go back and see the history. Of yes, the yes. Or who who did the merging at which particular time? Yes, how, how everything was chosen. That yeah, that's yeah. not somehow hard coded, it's just automatically chosen and then it you can go back and track back to the most of the way you built the theory then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's written at the so, so it seems to me, going back to Mustafa's question, that mm -hmm. the, the only major difference between federated learning and, and swarm learning is that there is no one coordinator. Mm -hmm. The coordinator is each time chosen, um, at, you know, after every few rounds or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. That that's the only major difference. But on the other hand, 
I can also see the disadvantage in that as well. Mm -hmm. And that's not a criticism of your work. It's it's in general, mm -hmm. federated versus form. And that could be that in case of federated, you're relying on one central coordinator that has the compute capacity for doing everything that's needed mm -hmm. to be done. Whereas in this case, you're relying on everyone to take over that job from time to time. Uh, but uh, here for merging, you don't need a very big computational, yeah, but because even in federated learning, the compute happens in local side. Yeah, yeah. Only the merging happens in the central mm -hmm. part, but this central part can has to be always secure and has to be always online. But here, if one peer drops out, it's not a problem. It It is only a problem after it is elected to merge, then it drops out, but that happens in like just few seconds, because it's just averaging. It's not doing much of a thing. So it's just putting everything together and sending it back within that fraction of second. If anything happens, then it's a very, very rare so, exception. I mean, in theory, if, if for example, this considers I'm a Marisol actor, mm -hmm. do I actually need to know your percent and would not to be the elected? No, I can actually sabotage half of the distribution network. Your most in Rosa will fail. And it can be done by DDoS would be even similar vector of attack. You mean same thing with federated learning? Yeah, I mean, that's basically so the same decentralized learning paradigm will have that issue when you use DDoS to have out of one of the matters. It's different though, because it, it basically when you discover in the merge libertarian and everything before that bloody fail, mm -hmm. in the KFR, then it, because your, your trend will already happen, even when the centralized got isolated, mm -hmm. the growth and old days still finish. But all the central, yeah. all the Leader, no, correct me wrong here, is doing is just doing all gather and have weighted average and just yeah. gather. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's the same as third learning. So there's no difference than DDoS and central learning. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Can you translate what DDoS means? Yeah. Denial of service. Denial of request. Yeah, but what is DDoS? I think denial of, denial of something. You should read the denial of service. You should read the denial. Oh, okay. So yeah. lots of different computers send of requests to the server. Yes, from my own knowledge about DOS, but denial of service, <laughs> about DOS. Okay. So, sorry, just quick question. When you say merging, you mean averaging? Averaging, yeah. yeah. When I say merging, it's just averaging. Mm -hmm. If there are five centers, then putting everything together and then dividing it by five and sending it back at times. There are yeah. many merging paradigm also. So is it only support for or valid only for average? Uh, no, the thing is in the newer version, they want to bring up new things like different forms of averaging of weights, but that's still not up on the present version running. But our yeah, ideology is to somehow make it open source and redo everything from scratch. And that at that time, we want to have different form of merging uh, techniques. Because actually you can fit the dog version basically Electing swarm on certain level or effect of shadow on the merging electing hops. You can go sensory do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the event worth it? <laughs> I mean, it will be worth it because basically the the overhead is basically the same. Assumably, you basically have a backup horse. And because the chain of randomly elected second horse is the same on the other one. So the chain of tips in both of them are quite low, I think. I would imagine. Yeah, maybe we have a separate discussion on that. Yeah, after after the presentation, so we can discuss that in detail. So uh, yeah, where were we? Okay, here in communication protocol, as I told, the information exchange happens mostly with TCP/IP ports, and here are few ports which have to be whitelisted or open uh, when we start swarm learning. For default, SN SN sharing of blockchain initialization, this specific port, and then for API port of SN, we need, which sends the state, what is the state in each SL node that has to be this specific node. And here the SWCI and SWOP node is managed from this port. And uh, file transfer generally takes place on this specific port. And the license server where SN, SL, SWOP and SWCI connects to the license acquisition mostly default but this could be changed this is the default that they have but we have tried different ports and but mostly we need to have kind of six ports open but we can even have a proxy uh reverse proxy section where we just need one port to open and then using that proxy we can try but that's a proposed 
solution, but we have not tried it and tested the proxy version, but we have tried by opening these ports, it, it works fine. So second part, some questions that we had before starting the research that I did was what are the major concerns in clinical AI, which we felt is data sharing, mostly because in some of the papers where we saw with the increase in the amount of data, the model performs better. So what we could have more data and get the best model, which could be yeah, accepted anywhere. So we did, had this problem because multiple centers cannot share their data and it's patient data. So that's why we went to this approach. And then how did we address it with swarm learning? And then we wanted to check in our work that I will show, which is one of the example that we have, is was there a drop in performance if you use swarm learning and if we use the normal putting all the data at the central points, then what we just wanted to start the proof of concept. And then some of the challenges that we faced, I will, uh, we want to, wanted to address. And then how to improve and make swarm learning better is to make it, uh, open source and available for everyone. So this was the first nature paper that we got out where we had uh, predicted microsatellite instability and VRAF mutation on, on the colorectal cancer patient. So here you can see we did the standard uh, classical approach, which we say uh, took a whole slide image, uh, divided it into uh, tiles, extracted features from that, and then predicted whether there is MSI, yes or no on a pre-trained ImageNet ResNet model. So only the final fine tuning was done with Swarm Learning. And then we wanted to show how, how is it different by putting everything together. So this was three peers. Three. Three. Yeah, three peers. We had separate three physical systems in, in a single location, but it was three separate things. Then we even tried to make it three different locations throughout Germany and then it had the same performance. So yes, then we had the second paper in gastric cancer, where you can see we had a data set from Bern, uh, Germany, as well as Leeds. And then here you can see we have five models that we want to uh, evaluate on a complete external cohort that was one, one of each local model training, one by putting everything together, and one which is trained on Swarm. So what we ideally wanted to expect is that swarm model and the central model should kind of perform the same. That is what we wanted to show. So this was the workflow that we used with local and swarm learning at the final end. And this was the study design where each hospital was one system that we considered and then only the parameters got shared. And then there was a security around that. And then we have. Sorry, you you yes. only you only um, learn the classifier, the classifier, right? Yes, As a feature. Extractor. Yes, yeah, just just the classifier. We didn't learn the feature extractor. Only the classifier. But what what was the challenges if you want to train the feature extractor? Uh, no, there. Uh, the, when we were doing this, the uh, HP Swarm framework didn't support ResNet based uh, uh, feature extractor to somehow. Uh, modify the whole, but now we can do that. There is no difference. We checked by giving the same codes. There's no performance, but it's the same. We can do completely everything in a single flow. Okay. Yeah. We've also got a, que a question from Lydia online, uh, who's asked regarding opening ports. I imagine for most healthcare institutions, it'd be a big hurdle to open or whitelist a port. Mm -hmm. How have your experiences been with that? This is something that can be circumvented in federated learning as the server can initiate all communication therefore not requiring whitelisting ports from each client or participating institution. Yes, definitely. I think that's a very big uh, concern that even we have, but that's what I told. There is a alternative option of having a proxy server where you just need to open one port and then the communication can happen through that. So that is one of the technique, but then every, I think every technique comes with some small disadvantages, which we have to work around. And I think that is one of, one of the things that we have to address. Thank you. Yes. So the cohorts that we used, I just put out some numbers. Here are the three training cohorts. We had this split with MSI high, non-MSI, and the total number of patients, and which was the test cohort, train cohort, very clear in the, and for BRAF mutated and wild type, we had these specific numbers. In the colorectal cancer case, that was the nature med paper. And then we had, the gastric cancer where we uh, uh, 
the targets were MSI as well as EBV. And then here we had the train and the test cohort split in this spe specific pattern. So I think next we go to the results, which is okay. So here, let's see. okay, it's pretty slow. Okay, so here you can see that the swarm merge model and the swarm model somehow perform similar. In fact, the swarm model is not so much different with different runs. So what we did is experiment, uh, repeated the experiment five times to say that it was not just pure coincidence, but the, it's consistently performing in the same way. And one thing we definitely noticed is that the swarm model is most of the time better than one of the individual centers. So if we had just access to one center, but the swarm model definitely performs better than that. So sorry, do you mind if you just um, explain to us what the B checkpoint one is and B checkpoint yes, two? Yes, B checkpoint one and B checkpoint two were the two checkpoints that we had when the data somehow I will show it to you in this image. Uh, if there is one center with very small data size, so here you can see this was the B checkpoint one and B checkpoint two. Uh, if there is one data center with just 100, 100, uh, 100 patients. So the data, uh, if we have the number of epochs for training, like finished within five, another center is having 500 patients. So with the one epoch of the bigger data center, all the five uh, epochs of the smaller data center. So that, that was B checkpoint one and B checkpoint two. So then what we did is a weighted study where it gave more weightage to the one with a lower number of patients and ran it for higher uh, less weightage to the one with the lower number of patients and ran it for more number of epochs. Then we had the weighted checkpoint, which ended at the exact same point for all the three centers. So, so that was that. Sorry for not mentioning. And okay, so can I have one question? Yes. Number uh, of patient per cohort. What does that mean? Patient per cohort. The, the X axis. Ah, yeah, okay. That uh, what we did is we even wanted to show that uh, swarm learning approach that we used is uh, uh, is uh, data efficient. Like if we there were some cohorts with eight hundred patients, but what if we cut down all the cohorts to one specific number of patients? So four hundred is all the cohorts had just four hundred patients. 300 is all the cohorts just to show that it's data efficient. So, let's so, to, to check whether I understand correctly. So, for example, we have four, four different centers. Yeah, three, that's three the, different centers. That's the three. Uh -huh. And then, so that means 75? Yeah. Uh, total number of patients? 425. Yeah. That's the, the, the uh, 20, 25. Yeah. yeah, yeah, total. So 25 from each side. So 75 total number of patients. Okay. 25 from each side and then totally. So, so when it is 50, it is 50 from each side to 150 patients from for the whole study. So, and then this was the performance. So because you're selecting such a small subset, does it not depend on which subset was selected? Yes, that's any pores of that, it, you know, which 50. Yes, that's what that was randomly chosen just to see whether with a lower number of patients it works fine. But it would be randomly a good, really good subset or a really bad subset. <laughs> yeah, but here you can see that with the lower number of patients, there is very big fluctuation because it was dependent on which patient came in the 25. So that's why it, it's very much fluctuating at that, that point where, where the number of patients reduce. There is a very big difference between each each time when you run the experiment, it gives a very different uh, approach because there is random selection of tiles that we do and a lot of factors influence at that point. So here you're showing that the decentralized learning is actually working a little bit better than uh, uh, you uh, aggregate. No. no, we can't say that conclusively uh, that it is working better, but we can say it's, it is not significantly different. In one of the tables upcoming, I will show you the exact numbers. Mm. When we did a p-test, it is not significantly different from the centralized ones. Did you compare these take all three cohorts 
plane on the all low plane. Yeah, that's that's the merged model, right? Yeah. So the red one is. Oh, red is not swarm one. No, no, the pink one is the, the swarm one. Oh, okay. uh, red one is the yeah, yeah. putting everything. That that yeah, was the yeah, proof yeah. of concept. But this we cannot do in all our studies yeah, because course. yeah, this was the proof of, and we had all the three cohorts, so we could put it together and then say yeah, there but, is no performance right, drop right. there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So autumn to uh, it's the same thing. They frame using the same parameter. Yes. So that means, for example, two fifty six pass size and yes. Have you assessed when the varying pass size, varying parameter? Uh, that's something in our list that we want to do is change the parameters in each, like yeah. hyperparameters in each different center, and try to do multi. But uh, for this study, we didn't do that because I had to manually sit on yeah sit on one system and start the process. And for every run, I had to update the license. And it was a lot of manual. Okay. Yeah, so, but now we have everything automated. Just with one click, we can do all these experiments. So we are continuously working on that too. And, uh, See. Another point is the result basically not on the independent set, but on the validation, proof validation. The results are always on external validation, so it's completely independent. So the the, the post work I've seen here. Yes, on the there is no internal validation results. It's all all external validation. So the test set always remains same for all the analysis that we do. That only the model training changes with the number of patients. Is it P2GA test set? Uh, for the first study, it uh. It was TCGA, and for the second uh, second study, it was TCGA, and first study it was uh, it was Quasar, the one of our leads, 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 leads. So this was for MSI. You can see similar kind of performance, and these were some of visualization how how the model performed on mutated and wild type for the first study. This was the old way of visualization. Now we have a different technique. Uh, and here you can see gastric cancer. And here there is also some results that we want to show. This was the merged model, which we are saying, and this is the swarm model. So the p-value, when you compare it to the swarm model is not significantly different, but when you compare it to the individual ones, it's comparatively different. So, so what are the p-values there for? Uh, comparing each and every model to the swarm model. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Everything is compared. If you compare the merge model to the swarm model, how much how much longer does it actually take to train? Uh, yeah. But yeah, the merge model takes uh less time because the it's not yeah, sure. it's yeah. it's not waiting for all the uh, nodes to come up. I I would say I had one of the slide which has the. With different sync interval, the time for training changes drastically, yeah. but but it's not so long because we already extract the features. It's just playing with the fine tuning. So it's not a lot of difference that it is doing. But if we do end to end completely from image to analysis, then it is definitely longer because for each sync interval, it has to wait for a longer time. So yeah. So, and do you think the, I mean, clearly it's going to be a reduction in performance because you're averaging by nature of that. Is that the only thing you think it's doing to compared to the merge? Or is it just, or it could be anything else? Or is it purely just the averaging the weight process? Do you lose? Yes, I think it's sometimes it just uh, uh, rounds it up to a higher or lower. I think it's mostly because of the averaging thing mm -hmm. that there's a little bit up. But swarm learning, we don't propose to say that it performs better than. No, no, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. well. I was just saying just. Commentary. Yeah, yeah. So it's just because of that region that sure. there can be a little bit of difference. Yeah. So these were some of the heat maps from the gastric cancer paper that MSI, non MSI. And uh, yeah, okay. So speaking about some advantages, which I've already told in my study, and I have like eight minutes, we can do discussions in the remaining time. Uh, so it is decentralized, no data sharing, robustness is more, it's scalable, it can be increased to hundreds of peers, which we eventually want to do. And uh, collaborators, all the collaborators get the best model, better prediction performance, model is less biased because it is not trained on a single cohort, it is trained on multiple cohorts, and easy for different pipelines. What I mean by this is now we have 
adopted swarm learning for radiology, histology, any kind of thing. It's very easy to adopt it for a complete new pipeline. It's just a small callback that we have to assign and try to run everything. And then it's very easy to adopt for a different pipeline. There is no performance drop that we showed. And then some disadvantages to convince people to collaborate. <laughs> that's that's the challenge to say, yes, we are we are ready to set it up. Let's do some good studies. You use the Ethereum token part of the blockchain in a way. Uh, presently, the blockchain part, HP manages the framework. We use their framework and then we run our analysis on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's their IP. Right. So somehow we are trying to do some experiment from our side to because you make an interesting point about all contributors getting the best model. Yes. Whereby if you avail some data, you're actually benefiting from being part of the community. That that's yeah. some yeah, that's something which comes with the mm. yeah. This is with this incentivized participation. Is it? Yeah, it seems to be. Mm -hmm. Because um, if, if I an individual hospital, I want that affected up an edge over another hospital, right? Do I want to have a same best model as them? Yeah, but that's that's being selflessly contributing to a good cause, right? That you want. <laughs> <laughs> we know. Yeah, I'm saying that. We know. But you know, know those hospitals were like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no way there's any, any politics going on. Yes, yes. Uh... <laughs> we have to fight the fact that IT, the, the camera, the only industry that have like very open about multiple solutions. It's yes. not the same for, for all of it. Yes, so who are willing to do that gets, yeah, who will to collaborate with us, but who are not, they yeah, don't. But now I think generally the major concern what we have seen is that the data shouldn't leave the center. So we can assure them that so at least maybe 50% of the total population says that, okay, if the data is not leaving, then our data is secure, then we are okay collaborating. But they avoid legal issues. Okay. That's what we uh, want to propose that with a white paper or something saying that if you don't actually share your physical data, but now we don't need to have any data sharing agreements with the mm -hmm. collaborators to say oh, that. So wait, don't come under the DSA's. But I'm, I'm not not the, area? Yeah, it's, it's a gray area. I'm not the best person to come and. No. <laughs> so. Well, some may argue that this is drive data. It's data derived from their data. I mean, that's Facebook's model, like entire business model, though, is in like all of tech in general. So I guess, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so the other um, potential limitation of good data learning and swarm learning is that you're assuming that two things. First of all, that every center side node has the compute capacity, which knowing the NHS. In mm -hmm. the UK, mm -hmm. the NHS IT services, they're still in the 90s. So yes. don't expect them to manage any of your GPU resources mm -hmm. in general. It, it is probably a, a sweeping statement and mm -hmm. probably not entirely fair. Mm -hmm. But in general, in, in our experience, you know, the clinical collaborators mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the resources or the the hardware resources are the people who can manage those mm -hmm. resources. And the second major assumption is that um, you know, you, you're, uh, you're assuming that the model is complete and, and final. Whereas in our case, we're actively learning. actively you know, experimenting with new things with the model all the time. Yes, I think that that is a very good point. But for I answer your first question first that Computing resources, I think uh, going towards the developments that we have had in the recent past, like after COVID, like no one used to do remote uh, so much of remote, but now they are changing these things. So we expect at least one physical system to be at least computable that they can provide from a center, but setting it up, it's not a problem, right? Because even from remote, you can set the system up, but they need, we expect that they need to have, yeah, this is a change that they have to be a part of and contribute. And I think setting up one system with the GPU and, and the compute power 
should be the part of the change that they accept when they accept to collaborate. And I think a lot of our collaborators, when we speak with them, they are willing to do this because they have the budget for that and buying a new system and setting it up in there and which they can not, they need not explicitly keep it for swarm learning. They can still be using it for only when swarm learning is running, then they have to let it, let it do its work, uh, but they can still use it for other things. So that's the first thing. The second, the second question that um, you are, what, what are you experimentation? Yeah, this is again in the list that how do we actively, actively do the learning? How do we give more and more data and keep continuously updating this? So model? it's not just about the data, with the model itself, we're experimenting all the time. With the analytical pipeline, we're mm -hmm. experimenting all the time. I mean, every week I'm, I come to know from our students and postdocs say about something new that they tried in their model, in their analytical pipeline. Yeah, but then if you are, yeah, just then if you do some change of what we are doing presently for different pipelines, we have different branches and then you just pull that and start the swarm again, right? Like only you have to give is integrate with, with the swarm learning, maybe give some callbacks and then that should be the process that like for a complete new pipeline or for the same pipeline with few changes, you just do the pull and then run the whole experiment again, but you have to run the whole experiment that we have to do it here as well. So those changes should be, should not be a problem to do for, for uh, continuously changing things. I think it should not be a problem because anyway, you have to retrain the model, which you have to do it in swamp learning as well, but you have to know that the pipeline which it is using is the most updated one. You have to pull it and then give it to the yeah training. So you mentioned uh, the fact connectivity is a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's also a disadvantage in federated learning as well, where if you've got one, you're waiting for one of your clients to send a model and it's mm -hmm. going to be big. Do you have anything that you thought about? Uh, bad connectivity. When when I addressed it, I didn't compare it with federated learning. Yeah, uh, bad connectivity in the sense like uh, if we had set the minimum PS to ten, like one of them has a bad connectivity, then all have to just so, wait. Yeah. So yeah, so this is one in federated learning they can give the sharing and then maybe uh, even in that they have to wait. I Thank didn't com do the comparison yeah. between two, but in general, this decentralized approach has this problem where if the power goes off in one of the system or if there is no connectivity to connect and share this then the learning can never happen well even if just one of them has lower latency and that's going to be consistently low then you will have to wait is there not uh, that, like skip it every other that is not a problem right? because here you don't share a lot of uh, heavy data right it's just even your weights though could be if it's like a 250 megabyte model then you've got Pretty well, yeah. very unlikely yeah. to have worse latency than trying to send to Let's take out the transport. Let's take out the transport where you say in a way of the transport across hospital. Mm. That basically you will kill off your battery. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, just a mix well, we don't have to that even in the country, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so brilliant. Well, I think with that, we'll um bring the meeting to a close because the, the, the room's booked after this. So, but no, thank you very much. Yes. That was a really interesting presentation and it's nice to see that I think everyone else here found it very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we'd like to try and organize a meeting over the next couple of days while Oliver's still here, um, just to see if we can have a bit more of a discussion about swarm learning and uh, see if we potentially have any collaborations. So I'll probably drop, I'll drop an email around to everyone this afternoon to see if they're interested. But no, thanks again, Oliver. And um, a reminder to everyone online and also here, We've got a our next seminar meeting is on Monday the sixth of March. We've got Professor Mark Overville coming in. Um, he's um, done a lot of the My Dog challenges, um, so that should be a really interesting talk. In person? Not in person. Oh. On online. It's getting carried away, you know. <laughs> Externally, too. Huh? No, it's it's been great, really. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having me here and. You all can just see a little bit on the work that we have done or any new ideas, approaches, suggestions. We are we are here to collaborate and come up with a solution for that. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you.